All right, so we're gonna do two things today. I'm gonna start off talking about fluids, and, and I've got, as usual, uh, a big agenda. We'll see how far we get. And then I'll give you, at the end, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the midterm next week. Um, the midterm is cumulative, so there's stuff on the midterm that you've already, from the previous midterm. Definitely, you can see the same thing come up again. In fact, it's unavoidable, right? All of physics is cumulative. Everything you've already learned before the last midterm has to show up in some form on the test, even though that won't be what I'm focusing on when I'm testing you on explicitly, right? Um, but but uh, I'll, I'll do a little review in a bit, and we'll, we'll focus on the, uh, I'll put this down for now. We'll focus on the new stuff a little bit at the end of class. All right, so. I'm just going to mention a couple things from last time. I'm going to mention a different way, describe a different way to stuff you mentioned last time. What is about the buoyant force? So what did we learn about last time? We talked about uh, if you have some object, some pear-shaped object in this case that's underwater, we want to know what the buoyant force is on this object. We figured out that we could calculate it, and we did this with a sucan shaped object, a really easy thing to think about, right? It's flat on the bottom and it's flat on the top, right? We said, oh yeah, well, we worked it out with the area and the height and all that stuff. It turned out that the, the net force, due to the pressure differences in different places, it's bigger pressure down here, smaller pressure on top, right, inside the fluid, the result was there's a buoyant force. And all the buoyant force is, is the force of the water, or whatever fluid this is, on this object. And then calculate it by saying that the buoyant force is always pointing upward, right, and it's equal to the volume of this object, the submerged volume. In this case, they're fully submerged under the water, so it's the full volume of the object, right? Times what? Times the, the, times the, um, uh, the density of the fluid, which in this case is water, all right, fluid, right, times g. And this right here is just the mass, right? Density times volume, it's just mass. That's just the mass of the water that was displaced by the object. And we talked about how you can put a bathtub in a bathtub, so, and it'll still float. You get the right shape bathtub, it's a big enough bathtub. So what that tells us is that it doesn't necessarily have to be the case that that much water was displaced, but it's a calculational tool we can use to figure this out. And you might be wondering, you might wonder, well, wait a minute, we solved it for a really simple case. What about a complicated case? A shape like my body or a shape like a pear. That's pretty complicated, right? If you have a pressure over here, it's pointing that way. So there's some vertical component, right? You got some pressure right here, and there's some resulting force on the object pointing that way, and the forces are pointing in different directions, different parts of the object. But it turns out that if you do the integral, some big nasty integral of the entire surface of this object, right, and figure out exactly what the vertical component of that force is, the net force is going to wind up being vertical, pointing upward, and it's going to be just the same exact formula. It's going to work. It's the, it's the volume uh, displaced times the uh, uh, times density of fluid times g. And, and a simple intuition for why that's true is that if we had water, suppose we had water in here, just water filling up this volume. Suppose this were just some piece of cellophane in the shape of a pear. Inside there's water, just like outside. Now you're in hydrostatic equilibrium, right? This thing's not accelerating; it's just holding still, right? Well, if it's accelerating, it's not accelerating. That means Newton's second law tells us. Upward force are equal to downward force. They're equal and opposite, so they cancel out. The downward force I'm referring to is the downward force of gravity acting on the water. What is that? It's just this. Just the volume of the water times the density of the water times g. That's the downward force of gravity acting on this water. What's the upward force? It's the buoyant force acting on this water from the surrounding water. So that's a simple intuition for why this formula works. Why we don't have to actually do some terrible integral I would never have to do on a test or anything like that uh, to actually calculate, you know, based on the local pressure everywhere and the, and the changing shape. So that's why that formula works. Okay, simple intuition. I like that. Um, good. And the following formulas we got from last time. We defined density. That's just um, this mass density, mass over volume. Sorry, sorry, density. We also defined um, what was it? Uh, pressure. We defined pressure as a force over area. In fact, I was using these laws to, in this discussion. Right? I did these rules. I wouldn't say laws. These things are just definitions, really. The laws are the physics laws are uh, excuse me, Newton's second law, stuff like that. Okay, great. Um, so, so we talked a little bit about how deep you have to go into a pool to reach one atmosphere of pressure. I think you spoke out. Oh, ten meters. About right. Um, we can ask that question another way. If, if I'm really strong and I want to have a Coca Cola, but I'm, but I'm lazy, I'm gonna walk downstairs to get my Coke. I'm up on the third floor and I have a long straw. Now, can I actually suck hard enough to get the Coke to come all the way up the three-story tall um, straw? How high up could I get it to go? If I used a vacuum pump and really did as good a job as I could possibly do to suck the top of that straw, and I have a straw that doesn't collapse, it's a good it's a steel straw, right? So, um, you know, how high up could I go? You know how high that would be? How does that relate to how, to how far down you can go to get one atmosphere of pressure on top of uh, the pressure at the surface of the water? It's actually the same calculation. So, so if you have a pool of water down here, otherwise known as your Coke, I get a really wide blast of my Coke, and I've got some straw, and we evacuate the top. So this is so. In other words, you can put a top on it and say, let's evacuate it with a vacuum pump. So in here, the pressure equals zero atmospheres, right? And this is not gauge pressure. This is absolute pressure. There's nothing out there, no, no air. The air pushes down on the surface of the water here. It forces the water up here, or Coke, whatever it is. Coke has the same density as water, right? And it comes up to about right there. This height, from the surface of the water here to the top there, that is going to be, by the same rule we used last time, it's going to turn out to be, again, 10 meters. Same formula. What formula am I using? I'm, I'm, I'm using that hydrostatic equilibrium formula we had last time, right? That said that, uh, let's see, I'm going to write it more general form today. I'm going to write it as Bernoulli's equation. I'm going to say that the pressure someplace, it's called label one, so it's some location one, plus the gravitational potential energy per volume, right? So I'm describing this, I'm drawing the same formula, but I'm getting different names to everything. Height one, row one. Um, turns out there's another term we need two, um, but I, I haven't specified that yet. Equals the same thing somewhere else. So how do I write that? Well, I can write it by saying P2 for a different location plus row 2 G. G is always the same everywhere, 10 meters per second squared. H2 plus the thing I'm missing, actually, I'll just go ahead and write it down, and, and we'll talk about it as we go. One half row V squared. It's just kinetic energy per unit volume, right? So what I'm doing right now is I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, skipping ahead a little bit, just because we're going to see it a few times. Okay, I'm not sure. V squared. I don't have room as usual. All right, you can all see that. So what have I done? I'm running, this is Bernoulli's equation, and this equation relates the height of some water inside some, some volume of fluid, right, to the pressure at the same location, and the velocity of the water in that location, through this term, to all the same quantities in some other location within some continuous flow. This is actually a case of hydrostatic equilibrium. Everybody's holding still. So are these. So in both these cases, this term's not even there. There's no velocity. And you might say, we got the molecules are moving. That's true. But they're on average not moving. They're moving. Little molecule goes that way. That one's going that way. On average, the water's not moving. So that guy's gone. That guy's gone. So P1 plus rho 1 G H1 equals P2 rho 2 G times H2. I put subscripts on the rows, the densities, because this equation is general enough to handle a case where the fluid has different density in different places. But this is a case with, with as you know, as, this is a liquid here in this case, right? So the density is the same everywhere. So I could have left the subscript off there. The density is the same in both places. I'll just being general. There's things like air, right? You can, have, you can have gases that can be compressed in some places and expanded, so the density might change. So I'm just writing it in general, full generality. But, but right now, all I need to worry about is pressure and the constant rho times g times the height. So it's
nobody's moving, so the V squared terms are gone, and I'm left with the same formula we had before for the pressure beneath a certain distance in the water. In other words, when I'm talking about the pressure up here versus pressure down here, it's it's, it's like saying, oh yeah, instead of going deeper in the pool right here where the pressure goes up, I'm going higher up through some other some other little finger of water that's sticking up inside this uh, this tube. And in fact, what is this thing? I drew this last time. All this thing is is a barometer. So the way you measure pressure is by looking at the column of water that's supported by the atmosphere. The atmosphere pushes down the water here and it raises it up inside some evacuated chamber that's upside down, upside down cup. Here. But how tall would you have to make a barometer if you use water? It'd have to be 10 meters tall, right? It'd be huge. That's why we use mercury because what's different between mercury and water? Density. Yeah, density of mercury is gigantic. It's more than 10 times, 14 times as big as the density of water. So that's why you make barometers, or they used to make barometers out of mercury. I didn't turn it all out here because it's nasty. It's full of mercury. I scared of things. So I don't know for now. But anyway, but it's, but it's about this tall. It's about you know, 766 uh, millimeters tall, so tall is, because that's how much of a column of mercury is supported by the other room. Okay, so what else can we do with this equation? Um, we can use this to talk about, uh, to talk about um, oh yeah, oh, let's see. Um, let me do one thing before I go to that next topic. Before I start talking about relating um, pressures in, in a hydraulic pump, let me do this demo right now. So I told you guys last time or time before that you know, Newton's second law, all of the physical laws apply to the world of fluid physics, but people don't believe me. So, so let me ask you this. Can I push on water? It's kind of a funny way to say that. But I, say I can't walk on water, but can I push on water? I my, so this is a balance right here. There's water inside of a, a beaker, and there's an equal amount of mass over here. Can you see on the big screen? Yeah. So I just have a, you know, I have the scales of justice here, right? Just a balance. And on one side, I've got a mass. It's a bunch of metal. It happens by whatever it is, three and a half kilograms, whatever. And over here, I've got water in a beaker, right? Now, if I put my finger in the beaker, right, and push on that water, will, it re will I be able to push it down? Can I exert a force on the water by doing that? And I'll tell you, I'm not going to cheat. I'm not going to push the bottom of the beaker. I'm just going to put my finger in just in the top part of the water. So if I do that, will the beaker go down? Who thinks it will go down? A couple takers. Who thinks it's not going to go down? Now, if you're betting 20 bucks, would you still vote the same way? How confident are you? Who feels confident? Well, let's find out. All right, so here we go. There are more people saying this now. It's like two to one. It wasn't one. It was often it's like zero to 50. Like, people are convinced it's not going to go down. But I don't trust it with all that talk about uh, laws and stuff like that. Fluid. So let's see. All right, here I go. Oh, it's down it goes. See that? See that? I'm pushing hard. It's a lot of work pushing that water down. Pushing. See? And now it's oscillating, so I got it. Anyway, so, that, so there's a, the full demo for this thing is so elaborate and complicated. I just thought, let's just make it easy and bring this part out. This is already mind-bending enough, right? So what's going on? There's two ways I can think of this, to think about this problem and to calculate it. It's probably 20 ways, but there's two ways to come readily to mind about how to calculate um, what's going on right there. Like, what is the magnitude of the force that I'm exerting on the water? Well, I've already, we've already talked about, but last lecture and just today, we've already talked about a force. Like, does the water exert a force on my finger? Does it? What's it called? It's a buoyant force. Which way is it pointing? Oh, so if you use Newton, which law is it? Which of Newton's laws is going to tell us how to relate that to the force my finger exerts on the water? Third law, that's right. Newton's third law says there's equal and opposite forces. If I go to the force from the from the water on my finger, there's equal and opposite force. My, uh, what did I say? The other way around. So if the buoyant force is pushing up on my finger, which way is the force of my finger pushing on the water? Down. And by what? What's the magnitude of it? It's got to be the same, right? The buoyant, the force of the water on my finger, the W on F, right? Lots of subscripts as usual. That's going to be the same old formula. It has to be equal and opposite by Newton's third law. Oh, I know. I use Newton's third law to figure this out. Okay, it's for the greater knows what the heck I'm talking about. I got volume submerged. So I submerged part of my finger, not the whole finger. Whatever volume was submerged is what I'm talking about. Here's my finger in the water, right? So whatever this volume, that's what I'm calling volume. This right here. That's the submerged volume, right? And I'm saying that, okay, if I make a free body diagram, uh, forget free body diagram. I'm trying to relate, the third law, I'm trying to relate a force of one thing on another and then the force of the second thing on the first thing. So there's no free body diagram that would include both those forces, right? But that's okay. So I got, I can, we, we just write down the part of that. Submerged volume times the density. Is it the density on my finger or the density of the water? Water, correct. Times G. Okay, so that's one way to calculate this. What's another way? Another way to calculate it is like this. When I put my finger in the water, what happens? So here, here's my finger out of the water. The water goes down a little bit. When I put, you know, remember the Archimedes story, right? Archimedes jumps in the tub, water splashes out of the tub. Eureka, right? So what I'm drawing here is the change in the height. Right, so the change, let's call this change H right here. There's some change in the height of the water as a result of me putting my finger in. When I put my finger in, if it's taller, that means the pressure at the bottom of the tank stays the same, go up or go down. Up, right? There's a higher column of water above the bottom of the tank now. What's the difference in the pressure going to be at the bottom of the tank? Well, from all these sort of considerations up here, right, the change in the pressure as a result of adding my finger, right? So I put my finger in, results in a change, of, a change in the pressure at the bottom of the tank, and that's going to be a change of that H, that change in the height of the water column above me, right? Times, uh, what is it, it's H. Where's my formula? Oh, it's rho GH. So if we go through the talk side, you'd say, oh, yeah, uh, because what we do is we use Bernoulli's equation to relate the pressure here to the pressure there, which equals one atmosphere, right? Because there's one atmosphere of absolute pressure up here. Just underneath the surface, same thing, one atmosphere of absolute pressure. We go down here, difference of this big H, whatever that is, and we get some number down here using that formula. Do the same thing here, and there's a difference of this little h. So let's we'll just skip to the chase and put in this little h. This is like a delta h, if you like, between these big h's. There's a difference there. What do we get? We get h times uh, rho, it's rho GH. Okay. Again, rho of water. And how, how can we think about h in terms of the things where we're trying to see if it's the same as this formula up here? Well, what we said up here is that the force of, uh, let's see, w on f. Well, the force of the water on my finger is equal and opposite to the. Excuse me, by Newton's second law, I know that I have to, there must be a, a uh, if I put my finger in and I add a downward force on this thing, right? Then that means there must be an increased force, up, a normal force down here acting up on this so that it winds up not accelerating once it stops, it oscillated on this. But once it stops oscillating, we're in equilibrium again. The, the upper force on the bottom has to have increased by some amount. So the delta P corresponds to some, let's call it delta F um, um, of the scale on the water, all right? Lots of subgroups. So what does that equal? Well, we know how to relate force and pressure. Force is pressure times area. So I'd say, okay, that's just going to be the change in the pressure times the area. What's the area? Well, the change in pressure times the area, the area is going to be, well, it's, we can figure it out because the volume of extra water up here is this, that's, a, that's a displaced volume of water. That's how much the volume of the finger, the submerged uh, volume of the finger. In other words, V submerged is going to be equal to that, that height H times A. Does everyone
over a over the h is cancel as they have to, and I'm left with the same formula. Right? This is what survives. And that's what I told you. I got that's what you told me. That's what we got from using Newton's second law. So there's two ways to calculate this force. One is to think about the height and the increase in the, the column of water and the extra pressure on the bottom. That's why it goes down on the scale. There's a new there's added pressure in the bottom that results in a bigger force on the bottom, right? The other way to think about it is just with that first formula we had, and to calculate the, the buoyant force on the finger, use Newton's third law. Ah, there must be a downward force on my finger on the water. So I really like this demo. It forces us to think about water as a and other fluids as physical stuff, you know, just like the gas or the chalk or whatever it is. Newton's law is really no one gets a pass, right? Everybody's got to follow Newton's law, right? Including uh, fluids. Um, great. So uh, next thing I want to bring up from this from Bernoulli's equation, another way to use it. Again, focusing not at the velocity terms. Let's, let's not do dynamics just yet. We'll get to that in a minute. So in the old days, if you took your car to uh, to get it worked on, they would raise it up on a uh, this, this uh, what's it called? Pneumatic, pneumatic, pneumatic. Uh, uh, well, oil-filled thing, right? And it had a big cylinder on one side, right? And a small cylinder on the other. And this was all hidden from you. You didn't notice this, but there's a little thing over here. And your car goes up here, and I you know, I'll draw my car. I got a really nice car. Uh, so let me draw that. All right. So I got my you know mad wheels and stuff. The only explanation my car in a hot rod is they both spend a lot of time in the shop. Really, it's kind of sad. All right, I guess I'll do something sad. But the point is that you have a giant object sitting on top of this thing. Huge, heavy, right? And you've got some little guy over here, right? Some petite person who's lifting the whole thing up with his or her foot, right? He's got his hat on, his race, whatever. Arms akimbo, and he's just doing, he's just pumping his foot. And I'm going to this and say, that can't be. That's a scam, right? There must be somebody in the back who's got a big engine or something. So how does that work? Why does that work? Well, let's do, let's consider Bernoulli's law, right? Let's consider P1 up here and P2 down here, and then relate it to the forces, okay? So, there's a couple of things going on in this drawing, right? And of course, you know, all that matters, like this problem, there's all this superfluous stuff, there's some guy in overall just can't All that matters, right, is this height right here, and the pressure here, the pressure here. Um, and, we're, and let's see, so we've already figured out how to relate the pressures of different heights inside water if it's not moving. The water's not moving, no dynamics. So we take Bernoulli's equation up here, which is just a statement of conservation of energy, which I'll emphasize in a few minutes. And we say, P, okay, so what's the statement? It says P1 plus rho GH. And what row do I want? Well, this is oil. So I want row of oil, which may be different than row for water, but it's pretty close usually. But it's whatever the fluid is. Density of the fluid. Not density of the car, not density of the sky, or overall or anything else, right? So it's, it's the fluid row, oil, right? Row GH. And this is H1. And I'm, if you like, so I'm doing a, uh, my notation's a little sloppy. I'm using H here to mean a difference in height. I'm using it here to mean, so what I should do is say, let's call it Y1 or something, and then define a Y axis pointing upward. Now, last time I got all balled up with, with signs on my H's and Y's, but I was able to straighten it out by using my head and just step back from the formal equation. If you go higher up, and you're not moving, but this is hydrostatic equilibrium, the pressure goes down. So if I have a bigger, so if this one is better, when I finish my equations, there better be a lower pressure here than there is here. That keeps my head straight, right? And that's what I've got. This thing right here is some positive quantity. We'll call this, let's call this y equals zero and call this y equals h. Great. So now h1 equals h, h2, height of two is equal to zero, right? And so I'll say, okay, that equals h2. Okay, so this is all the hat, you know how to do this. Uh, and this doesn't really solve the problem of how you can lift this car. After all, by this rule, that means that there's a greater pressure down here than there is here. That would suggest you need bigger forces down here. In fact, that's the only thing that's going on. And we know that there must be a smaller force. That's why this guy can daintily push his foot down and lift my hot rod off the ground, right? So it must be there's something else going on. Oh, yeah, right. Zero, right? So we've got to relate the pressures, but how do we relate the forces? Well, the force here has to depend on the size of this area. So let's also define this thing. So there's a lot of problems in fluids. You'll see you'll have an area of velocity and a pressure at different locations, and you're going to relate them with Bernoulli's law. That's often what you're going to do. And so right here, same thing, A2. A2 is a small amount. It's the area, when I say the area, I mean the area of the bottom of the guy's foot, or the area, actually, it's the area of the cross-sectional cross area of this tube right here. Right? So he's pushing down right here with his foot on a little area A2. The smaller A2 is, the smaller the force he has to exert to achieve the same pressure. Why? Because P equals F over A, right? So that means that if I want to know how to relate these things, I can substitute in for, so my equation now is P1 plus rho G, uh, well, sorry, rho G H, for H is that height of that column of oil, equals P2, okay, fine. Now we can substitute in for forces and say, what is P1? Well, oh, that's just force one. I got my, make sure I get this in the right place. P is equal to F over A, right? Good. Plus rho G H equals F2 over A2. And so that solves the mystery of how it is this guy is able to generate sufficient force to hold that car up in the air. If A2 is small enough and A1 is big enough, right, then... Uh, yeah, let's isolate for the thing he's doing. Let's isolate for F2. So F2 is the, is the force he's exerting. He's exerting F2. And, and there's a force over here, F, with magnitude F1 over here. I didn't draw you to scale, right? F1 is gigantic. It's a heavy car. He's, got a little, he's just pushing just with a few pounds of pressure. But I just draw it so you can see the vector. Okay, great. So I have F2 is it equal. Oh, it equals A2 over A1 and F1. And there's another term over here with the rho GH as well. Um, that's all over. Oh, did I get that wrong? I sure did. I can just look at it and see it's wrong even without checking my algebra because there's no way. It has to be the case that this is a small number, right? So I say, okay, that means I had a 2 here and 1 here. Is that right? Keep me honest. Oh, it's still wrong. Oh, no, we have a Let's see. Well, we can figure this out. What did I do wrong? So pressure equals, make sure I got my signs right here. Oh, that was a problem. Yeah. Pressure is force over area. I substituted this force over area. I think that's correct. Yeah? Don't agree with this? I don't think this is correct. Yeah. Okay, we come down here. I want to isolate this guy. Oh, I see. The problem is I made two mistakes. And I corrected something that wasn't